Hello and welcome to Candidate Conversations. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michelle McCrae, Community Engagement and Member Services Coordinator at DCTV, and I'm thrilled to be your host for Candidate Conversations. Our role at Candidate Conversations is neutral. DCTV is a nonprofit organization serving as a community convener. Our goal is to give the community an opportunity to get to know the candidates by allowing each to present their platform to the community. In this era of COVID-19, providing DC residents the opportunity to get to know the candidates from the safety and comfort of their television viewing location is more important than ever. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with candidate John Cheeks, running for the office of delegate to the House of Representatives in the general election. Our first question is on the topic of DC statehood. Should the District of Columbia become the 51st state? In your opinion, why or why not? The District of Columbia should remain in its present status because of the funding that we receive from the U.S. government. The District of Columbia should also be, be given a right to vote on the floor, other than charging our taxpayers with an astronomical bill to become a state. Our community and our world are currently fighting a major pandemic. As a community leader, what would you do to address the range of issues caused by COVID-19? I would make the public more aware. I would increase our public services to help the citizens and residents of the District of Columbia cope through this, whether it's through assistance of uh, financial means, assistance through medical needs, as well as family outreach and community outreach needs. Thank you. As a leader, what steps would you like to take, if any, to achieve a just, equitable, and inclusive city, and why? The steps I would take first is only one step, to cure the injuries of the North American slavery system. The first step I would take is to give restitution to all people who are descendants of enslaved Americans who reside in the District of Columbia. I have a formative plan with a payout schedule that is ready to initiate once I'm elected in office. We appreciate your response. Now, Washington, D.C. has a long history as a leader in providing early childhood education and leads the nation in access to pre-K for both three and four-year-old children. The district is investing over $100 million to expand early childhood education. What do you see as the most important education priorities for serving these young constituents? Our educational system does have some areas that, that has to be modified. And it should begin at the rightful age of three to four years old, uh, which we call Head Start. We're gonna have to change the name of Head Start to Advanced Learning. And the model we should try to uh, uh, begin in the District of Columbia, we should re-schedule uh, uh, or redesign the ages of our children uh, on their learning process or, or the actual learning curve from four years old up until 16 years old. I would like to see our kids uh, somehow advance the, the the learning capabilities that our standard schools or I should say only have in, in, in giving to certain individuals. Uh, we would like to start our ch children out at three or four years old so that way we wouldn't have uh, what we call uh, honorary learning. All of our ch kids could have that as a standard selection. Candidate Cheeks, in the last few moments we have left, tell us what additional information would you like Washington, D.C. residents to know about you? Well, the additional information I'd like 
for the citizens and the residents of Washington, D.C. to know about me. I am a Washingtonian raised in Ward 6. I currently reside in Ward 3. I am a descendant of an enslaved American, a candidate, a great grandson of a sharecropper, a son of a engineer, a son who, whose mother has her MBA from the University of DC. I am proud to run for this seat. I will not be a lifelong candidate or a lifelong elected official. I seek this office for only three terms. And with those three terms, we will see the advancement of payouts for the injury of the North American slavery system, which some of us call reparations. But as we know, the new name is now recovery. All black Americans who have been injured by this will be afforded the right under my leadership to receive a check. That is my primary goal is to bring my people relief and also reduce taxes for other people who have been paying for dysfunctional programs. Candidate Cheeks, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. We thank you for coming on our show. All the best to you in the coming election. Hi, I'm Alvin Jones, native Washingtonian and president of AJ Productions and also the managing partner of the Alvin Jones Communications Group. You may know me from my work at Black Entertainment Television as the Unseen VJ, News Channel 8, Planet Vehicle, Planet Jazz, The Quiet Storm and WHUR, Sirius XM and C-SPAN. But what you may not know is that I got my start in media communications right here at DCTV as a member. DCTV has been serving the DC community for more than three decades by preparing members throughout this region for careers in media, rather it be in front of or behind the camera. And also the education training program is comprehensive and you can even gain access to the equipment and the resources that a creative person needs to bring a vision to a production reality. So that's my DCTV story. DCTV is meaningful media making an impact. Wash your hands, avoid sick people and touching your face. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. Brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Welcome back. You're watching Candidate Conversations on DCTV. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with candidate David Krukoff running for the office of delegate to the U.S. House of Representatives in the general election. Our first question is on the topic of D.C. statehood. Should the District of Columbia become the 51st state? In your opinion, why or why not? Okay, I'm not sure how much you all have worked with me or understand the advocacy for which I am the leader of, but I'm the leader of the retrocessionists. So 51st statehood is su superior to our status quo, which is disgusting and odious. However, the only way the residents of the District of Columbia have ever gained our complete voting rights without moving is through the process of retrocession. A second retrocession could occur, and we could create Douglas County, Maryland. We could retrocede. We could create economies of scale if it has precedent because it occurred back in the 1840s, 1846 to 1847, when the portion of the, the Virginia portion of the District of Columbia fell back or retroceded into Virginia, or what is presently called Arlington County, Virginia. I'm the creator of Douglas County, Maryland, and after I created Douglas County, Maryland, all of a sudden, Muriel and Eleanor started calling DC Douglas Commonwealth, being in the 51st state, they before were calling it New Columbia. Within weeks, that occurred. Our community and our world are currently fighting a major pandemic. As a community leader, what would you do to address the range of issues caused by COVID-19? Well, leadership is key. And certainly our present executive leader has not been leading by example. 
Um, so whether it's acting inappropriately out in public wearing a mask, if you see me hanging up signs around the town, I always have a mask on. Uh, whether it's acting appropriately in, in distance, so leadership by example, number one. Number two, have empathy and um, understanding for people who are disenfranchised, or not disenfranchised, but affected by the virus, whether it's economically or in other ways that could be in terms of their transportation or what have you. We need to work with each other to make things better. And we are gonna get through this. We're gonna have a vaccine. We're gonna work with the people who are in most need, the elderly first and, and uh, healthcare workers. And that's the way it's gotta be. And we will help lead that effort. Thank you. As a leader, what steps would you like to take, if any, to achieve a just, equitable, and inclusive city, and why? Thank you for that question. We have a city that is very well off, but is having some trouble right now. We are losing dollars every day. Our city has is, is, had many years of success, and now it's turned the other direction. We need to work together and not have the divides that we have, whether it's the one party rule in town or whether it's scolding Republicans on the Hill. We need to work together as a unified force, not trying to say, this is my team and I'm only for my team. And that could be, and that could be in relation to racial issues or it could be relationship to business issues or it can be relationship to political issues. We need to bring ourselves together and work together as a team, and not only for the district, but also for Maryland and Virginia. We are an economic engine that has to think of ourselves smartly. We appreciate your response. Now, Washington, D.C. has a long history as a leader in providing early childhood education and leads the nation in access to pre-K for both three and four-year-old children. The district is investing over $100 million to expand early childhood education. What do you see as the most important education priorities for serving these young constituents? Well, I'm happy that the District of Columbia is being um, at the tip of the spear or the, at the front of the vanguard toward early education. However, spending money hand over fist in general, not just with early education, but in general as a city, is something that we have to watch out for. We are twice as expensive as cities of similar size in terms of non-federal spending, whether it's Denver or Boston. And we can't just always spend our way out of things. If you look at our per capita spending in education or in other fields, we're really over the top. So we have to look at things to wake, make ourselves more efficient, perhaps merging with Maryland, creating Douglas County, Maryland, so we do not have to have most of our city agencies actually do state functions, and then we can really concentrate on the things on the ground, like early education would be better for us in the long term. I invite everyone to explore retrocession as not only a way for us to have complete voting rights, but to also to achieve economies of scale through a merger with Maryland and get things done. And the, 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 the information package that's being provided to us by the power structure in town is often incorrect and ignores fundamental things about economics, particularly when it comes to Medicaid, the judicial system and other areas. All these things cost billions of dollars and we need to figure out ways because our budget is already twice as expensive of cities of similar size like Boston or Denver. I invite everybody to explore that with us. Candidate Krukoff, in the last few moments we have left, tell us what additional information would you like for Washington, D.C. residents to know about you? Well, my family came to the District of Columbia. My great-grandfather came to the District of Columbia around 1890. My great-parents, great-grandparents were disenfranchised. My parents, my, great, my grandparents were disenfranchised. My parents were disenfranchised. I'm disenfranchised. Let's fix this. Our campaign is the Purple New Deal. We are not looking to be the red team or the blue team or the purple team. We can work together. We can look at history. We can look at economics. We can provide empathy and credibility. 
by listening and work, working with the people and, and being at the ANCs, and we can fix things together. But we have to let go of some of the partisanship and modus operandi of contention that has been the, the modus operandi of the 30-year incumbent that presently is in the office of DC delegate. Candidate Krukov, we appreciate your time with us here today and thank you for coming on our show. All the best to you in the coming general election. Thank you for having me and I really appreciate everything you all do at DC TV. Are you ready to vote safe, DC? A mail-in ballot will be sent to every registered voter beginning the first week of October. The deadline to register is October 13th. If you miss the deadline, you may still vote in person with acceptable proof of residence. When using any of the acceptable forms as proof of residency, be sure that the document is valid within 90 days of its issue date. If you do not receive a ballot by October 21st, you should be prepared to vote in person on November 3rd. Early voting starts on October 27th. The DC Board of Election is available upon request to provide assistance including curbside voting for senior citizens and disabled citizens at voting center locations. Contact the Board of Elections in advance for arrangements. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by DCTV, where meaningful media makes an impact. My life was in shambles and I was trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces. AA not only keeps me sober, it helps me live a much better life. If you have a problem with alcohol, contact AA. It works for me. Hello, this is Angela Harris, Vice President of Community Engagement and Programming for DCTV. The COVID-19 pandemic is disrupting businesses and service providers across the globe, and the effect is being felt here in DC. We are working diligently to provide for the health and safety of our employees and to do whatever we can to meet the needs of our community stakeholders. As part of our commitment to provide meaningful media, to support our communities through this challenging time, we are joining efforts with the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization to encourage you to monitor the pandemic situation closely and to follow the guidelines of local and federal officials. We also invite you to engage with DCTV and join us for the wonderful community programs you'll find on our channels that are produced here locally by, for, and about the city where we live. We wish you and your family excellent health and an easy journey through these challenging times. Welcome back. You're watching Candidate Conversations on DCTV. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with candidate Omari Musa, running for the office of DC delegate to the House of Representatives in the general election. Our first question is on the topic of DC statehood. Should the District of Columbia become the 51st state? In your opinion, why or why not? Well, yes, we uh, support uh, the District of Columbia being a, the uh, 51st state. Uh, we think the residents of the district have the right to, as every other citizen in the United States, for representatives to represent us in the various organs of uh, government here in the United States. So that's, yes, we're for that. Uh, part of that, though, is also that there are 50 states, as you point out, uh, and most of us who live in the other states uh, have many, many problems, and uh, just being a state won't solve our problem. It will give us the right to vote on our budget, for example, things like that, but it won't solve the problem of unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Our community and our world are currently fighting a major pandemic. As a community leader, what would you do to address the range of issues caused by 
COVID-19? Well, there are a couple of things that stand out. Um, one is, is that the U.S. government, for example, uh, is doing absolutely nothing uh, to solve the problem that we in the district and around the country are facing with this ep epidemic. For example, uh, they, in um, homes where there are older citizens, uh, they have the highest uh, rate of incident of the disease, yet we're still crowded into small spaces where safety is not an issue. So it's necessary, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of empty hotel rooms in Washington, D.C. that the residents can be put into so that they're safe uh, and healthy. The other thing is, is that it's pretty obvious, is that in Washington, they've closed down two hospitals, for example, when what we need are actually more hospitals to service uh, the residents of Washington. Uh, so one of the things that we propose that's connected to that is to have a crash public works program to build uh, hospitals as well as other things in the district by working people who are now unemployed. So that way you begin to uh, attack both problems at the same time. And we need to open up the medical schools to provide more doctors. I'll give an example later on of one of the countries in the world that I think is making progress along that line, and that's Cuba. As a leader, what steps would you like to take, if any, to achieve a just, equitable, and inclusive city, and why? Well, the first thing I'd mention is to begin to uh, work against the divisions that, are, that exist amongst us. The biggest division is uh, amongst those who have a job and don't have a job. Uh, so that's why we call for a public works, works program to provide jobs for everybody in the District of Columbia at union scale wages. And, if, um, there, and also to spread around the available work uh, with 30 hours work for 40 hours pay and that those of us who are on things like Social Security, et cetera, have cost of living uh, increases as the cost of uh, living goes up, foods going up, housing going up, and so on. Uh, the other things that we uh, suggest is that the uh, working people in this city need to have unions. And we don't have any unions in most workplaces. The place where I work, for example, is the largest uh, public private employer in the United States, Walmart. Uh, and we have no union to protect ourselves, uh, the safety conditions, the wages, the hours on the job. And we need to get ourselves together and organize so that we can fight for those uh, basic interests that working people here confront. The final thing I wanted to mention is uh, around the question of transportation. Many of us, uh, for example, use public transportation, and public transportation is a calamity in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you work certain hours, the uh, metro doesn't work, the buses aren't working. Uh, what are you supposed to do to get home? Uh, pay half of your salary uh, in taxi cab fares and so on and so forth. So we call for a free public works system that works 24 hours a day. We appreciate your response. Now, Washington, D.C. has a long history as a leader in providing early childhood education and leads the nation in access to pre-K for both three and four-year-old children. The district is investing over $100 million to expand early childhood education. What do you see as the most important education priorities for serving these young constituents? Well, basically, I think uh, it's uh, almost impossible to get a decent education uh, in capitalist America. Our, our young people are treated to all kinds of falsified histories, partial histories, and so forth. Uh, it's good that there's a, an investment in uh, early childhood education in Washington but it should be put under the control of the parents and the teachers as opposed to bureaucratic apparatuses that siphon off most of the money uh, into useless projects that uh, don't advance the interests of, of working people and the youth in the city. So we would scale back most of that bureaucratic apparatus uh, and, don't, and then have many teachers uh, and parents actually organize what they think their children need. Today we have a very big crisis. The schools are closed. Uh, what do you do with the kids? There's no such thing as education nowadays in Washington, D.C. or around the country. They're not safe. Uh, the bureaucratic apparatus says we'll either go back to school or we won't go back to school. But nobody ever mentions safety in the schools 
and for the children that's in it. So that would be number one priority. And the people who know that the best are the medical personnel, the teachers, and the parents. Now, Candidate Musa, we have just a few moments left. So within that time, tell us what additional information would you like Washington, D.C. residents to know about you? Well, one of the things that we promote very strongly, and we, we found that a, a lot of residents in Washington uh, in our campaigning, we go door to door. We just knock on doors, and then we begin to engage in discussion with whoever answers. We propose that working people, we need our own political party, a labor party that fights in the interests of us, not in the interests of the rich. Uh, we think uh, the idea of tweedly dee and tweedly dum, you get one or the other, and working people are still in the same spot we were in before. So what we need is a party of our own, a labor party that has a program to advance the interests of working people around jobs, housing, unemployment, mass incarceration, and the things that afflict us as opposed to a bureaucratic apparatus that function in the interests of the rich. So we propose a labor party, a fighting organization based on the labor movement in uh, Washington, D.C. and the United States, a fight in the interests of working people. And we're finding that a lot of people agree with that perspective because they see that neither the Democrats or Republicans offer any alternative to working people. And they're very happy that a working person is actually running for office on a program in the interest of working people, which is the Socialist Workers Campaign. Candidate Musa, that brings us to the end of the time we have for now. It was great speaking with you. All the best to you in the coming general election. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Please listen to this message in its entirety. There is currently a motion being filed to suspend all bank accounts and tax returns bearing your name and social security number. To review immediate rights and details and avoid all further proceedings, please contact our firm at 1-844-898 or you may press 1 to be transferred to your case manager immediately. Watching Candidate Conversations on DC TV. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with candidate Oye Owolewa, running for the office of United States Representative, the shadow seat in the general election. Our first question is on the topic of DC statehood. Should the District of Columbia become the 51st state? In your opinion, why or why not? Thank you for that question. Absolutely, it is about time the District of Columbia becomes the 51st state. Right now, DC residents are the only Americans living in a non-state that pays federal income taxes. What that means is that our money is being used to fund national policies in which we have no say over. So while the government likes to use our money, it's important that we let them know that our voice is also important and we shall not be oppressed, suppressed, or muted. Thank you. Our community and our world are currently fighting a major pandemic. As a community leader, what would you do to address the range of issues caused by COVID-19? 
Thank you for that question. And one of the big consequences of COVID-19 is that DC residents are now starting to feel the brunt of not being a, a state. So when the CARES Act came through the Congress to provide support for all places and Americans dealing with COVID, we were treated and relegated as a territory status. So what that ended up being is that DC residents received less than half the funding to fight COVID. Our National Guard wasn't deployed on time to care for our issues. We don't have control over our budget and we don't have control over our laws. So the disparity is wide and far reaching and now it shows us that COVID, COVID has shown us what it means to not be a state and we demand statehood now. Thankfully, our mayor and our council members have really put forth a lot of energy to make sure that we're recovering from COVID. However, once we become a state, we'll be able to empower ourselves and make our final decisions to make sure we're taken care of. Thank you. As a leader, what steps would you like to take, if any, to achieve a just, equitable, and inclusive city, and why? The first thing we need to do is take control over our laws. One thing I said before about not being a state is that we don't have final say over our decisions. Then we need to bring forth all of the groups, whether it's activism groups, whether it's just DC residents who are very passionate about certain issues to the table. We need people to reflect our values and we need our lawmaking process and our representations to reflect our people. That way we match our laws with what we want our country to be. We want a more fair society, less cruelty, less cruelty, and also just a much better and safer area for our kids to be in. Now, Washington, D.C. has a long history as a leader in providing early childhood education and leads the nation in access to pre-K for both three and four-year-old children. The district is investing over $100 million to expand early childhood education. What do you see as the most important education priorities for serving these young constituents? So I'm extremely passionate about education. Outside of being a doctor of pharmacy, I've been volunteering in elementary schools for the past six years to get young people, especially people in underserved communities, to get interested in science. I do fully believe that there's an opportunity for the community to get very involved in an educational process. I think there's too much pressure put on teachers, administrators, and bureaucrats they like to make the positive changes in our kids' learning when there's so much learning that can be done outside of school. There are a lot of doctors in the neighborhood. There are a lot of lawyers in the neighborhood. There are a lot of people who can impact these young people's minds, and I'm very supportive of any initiative to bring the community to the classroom. I also believe in further investment in our children's education, and I commend our leadership in DC for always putting the dollars where our mouth is and making sure young people and pre-K students are getting as much support as needed. Now, candidate Owolewa, in the last few moments we have left, tell us what additional information would you like for Washington DC residents to know about you? I want to thank you again for having me. I'm once elected, I'd be the first Nigerian American ever elected to, U to U.S. congressional history. But even more important, it's very important that we have people who have our values and our backgrounds and our interests at the lawmaking table, whether you're an animal activist, whether you believe in a more fair society where the richest pay their fair share in taxes, whether you believe in criminal justice, whether you believe in Black Lives Matter. It's about time that we stop shouting at lawmakers and become the lawmakers ourselves. So I'm very passionate about this. I thank you for the opportunity and I hope to earn your support. For more information about me, you can visit oya4dc.com. You can also reach me on Instagram. I'm oya4dc, number four DC. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook as well under my name, Oye Owolewa. Thank you. Candidate Owolewa, we appreciate you coming on our show and we hope all the best to you in the coming general election. I'm Michelle, Member Services Coordinator at DCTV. I stand against racism and bigotry because they're wrong. My greatest concern is for future generations 
and the lessons we're teaching them. For change to happen, we have to start at the most basic level of society, which is family, because many of us value that the most. We all want to see our families prosper and be great citizens of the world. We all are human beings in this journey of life together. And of course, all lives matter. However, black lives are disproportionately endangered due to hate, brutality, and violence. Systemic racism still has a devastating and generational impact on the black family. My first awareness of when my skin color was an issue in society was when I was about age six or seven. Since my toddler years, my family and I would take an annual summer vacation. One year, my sister and I were so excited to play with a neighboring family's granddaughter. She happened to be white, and we'd first met her and played with her the summer before. During the returning summer, our playmate told us that she could no longer play with us. When we asked why, she said it was because we were black. In the span of one year, our playmate had been taught racism and how to spread it. That was a painful experience that's still with me today. Parents shouldn't have to have the talk with children so young to explain racism, but it's still a reality in the black family today. Working at DCTV, I can leverage my voice for change. Knowing that I'm part of an organization that shares my values and desire to stand against racism and hate is very rewarding. So I'm raising my voice to speak up for change, hoping that the next generation can live in a better world. Our children are watching. I have a voice. I have a story. I am DCTV. For nonprofit organizations, reaching your audience is more complicated than ever. It's tough to cut through all the noise, even if you're telling a powerful story of community impact. But telling that story just got a whole lot easier with new capacity building grants from DCTV. DCTV is the district's only television station devoted to programming by and for DC residents. Our new grant expands the power of local nonprofits to connect to people throughout the district and beyond. You'll be featured in programs on our dynamic network that broadcasts 24 7 on all three DC cable providers and online. You'll boost your social media platforms with professionally produced videos. And you'll join a dedicated group of people working to uplift our communities. It's more urgent than ever to connect, engage, and inspire. We help you do that with the professional resources you need to seamlessly support your mission. It's easy to apply. Go to dctv.org slash grants to learn more. When I was young, I was plagued by fear and self-pity. Drinking made me care less about my insecurities. My life was in shambles, and I was trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces. At first, I never drank on the job, but eventually, I... I did. Removing alcohol wasn't enough. It left me depressed and lonely. That's where AA offered a solution. The people I met thought like me. For the first time in my life, I felt like I wasn't so crazy. I remember sitting in the AA meeting and thinking, I finally found a place where I belong. I never thought I could have made it through those hard times as the happy person I am today. AA not only keeps me sober, it helps me live a much better life. I found out I can do this thing one day at a time. I've never been happier in my life. If you have a problem with alcohol, 
Contact AA. It works for me. And for me. And for me. Welcome back. You're watching Candidate Conversations on DCTV. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with candidate Soher Saeed, running for the office of United States Representative in the general election. Our first question is on the topic of DC statehood. Should the District of Columbia become the 51st state? In your opinion, why or why not? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked me that. Absolutely. My, I believe Washington, D.C. should definitely be the 51st state. My role as a United States representative would be, to fight for the, uh, would be to fight to become the 51st state. I believe that living in D.C., working in D.C., paying taxes in D.C., we should have a vote in Congress. Without having a vote in Congress, it is not a true democracy. We have over 700,000 people that live, work in D.C., and it's a myth when people say it's only bureaucrats or people outside. They're real people like you and me, living in D.C., working in D.C., paying taxes in D.C. In fact, our population is greater than Vermont and Wyoming, yet we do not get a seat at the table. We pay more income tax per capita than any other state. And I think we pay more federal tax over 22 other states. So I think, and I think majority of DC residents want statehood. We want to have a say. We want to know that our voice matters. And that is why I'm running today. I'm running to let everyone know, let my children know that our voice matters. And we deserve to have the 51st state. And because of that, I'm running. Thank you. Our community and our world are currently fighting a major pandemic. As a community leader, what would you do to address the range of issues caused by COVID-19? Thank you, Michelle. That is something the whole world is dealing with. COVID-19 has definitely taken a huge toll on DC and its residents along with the rest of the country and the world. As we are digging ourselves out of this pandemic, I would like to point out DC has been treated in a very different way than other states. When the federal government passed the CARES Act, $1.25 billion was allocated to each state. However, DC, since it's not considered a state, was only allocated $500 million to uh, fund the citizens and help them come out of this pandemic. DC has always been treated differently, even when DC residents vote for certain laws or the district, the DC council passes laws, they can be superseded by Congress. Congress has come in and superseded a number of laws that have pertained to marijuana legalization, marriage equality, women's reproductive rights, and others. So I believe that now is a very important time for everyone to come out and vote, exercise your right, because if, as we expect, the Senate will turn Democrat we will have a Democratic president, we will have a Democratic Senate, and the H.R. 51 bill, which is up for first time read in the Senate, has a real chance of passing. So the momentum is now, if you want D.C. statehood, if you want to be the 51st state, I encourage everyone to go out and vote. Thank you. Now, candidate Saeed, in the few moments that we have left, tell us what additional information would you like Washington, D.C. residents to know about you. I am a resident just like everyone else. I'm a lawyer, I'm a wife, and I'm a mother. I am living in DC and I feel like I'm just another average person off the street, but just watching how things that have gone by with the Supreme Court nomination coming forth and DC not having any senator to call and say, wait, I don't want the nomination to go through before elections. We don't have that ability, and I couldn't take it. That's why I had to jump up and say, this is my time, I need to come in. The historic HR Bill 51 passed in, on June 26, which was monumental in the House, and that is the first step towards the DC statehood. 
I feel should the blue wave come, which we all expect should happen in the Senate, if we get a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic House, DC statehood will be a reality. And for that reason, I jumped into this race. Well, candidate Saeed, that brings us to the end of the time we have left for today. All the best to you in your run for the election. I'm Angela, and I'm Vice President of Community Engagement, Programming and Communications at DCTV. I stand against hate and bigotry. Prior to coming to DCTV, my experience included work as a university professor and the chair of the Journalism and Media Studies Department at major universities. One of the most impactful courses that I've taught has been the study of race, gender, and class in the media. The medium of television, like movies, print, radio, and digital, is incredibly powerful. Our social norms are accepted or rejected based on what we see and hear in media. Voices of the powerless are often marginalized, and too often, they are silenced. This speaks to the importance of community media. DCTV gives voice to the voiceless. We provide an open platform for all to be heard. We want the voices of black, brown, yellow, white, LGBTQ, different abilities and religions all to be heard. As an employer, we have a zero tolerance for discrimination and hate. As a leader in business and as a humanitarian, I feel a personal responsibility to bring new ideas and innovation that will create change. That only happens through diversity. Every perspective matters. Inclusion means everyone. Black Lives Matter is not an exclusion of anyone. It's a movement against brutality and hate. This is a time for us to work together towards equality and change. I have a voice, I have a story, and I am DCTV. My client was waiting for me to post the final draft for this project online. Then the phone buzzed. The person told me I had 45 minutes to pay up or my electricity would be cut off. No electricity, no internet. They told me to get one of those prepaid credit cards, so I did it. If you receive a call threatening to disconnect a utility service, stop. Hang up and call the provider back using the number on your bill to verify and contact the Public Service Commission or the police to report scammers. Fight utility scams, the power is yours. Are you looking for lower energy rates or renewable energy sources like solar and wind? DC Power Connect can help. District Energy customers can now shop online at dcpowerconnect.com for their energy supplier. DC Power Connect is an online tool that gives DC consumers the power to choose the right energy plan for them. Visit dcpowerconnect.com and find out how you can shop for your energy today. DC Power Connect, your energy, your choice. Welcome back. You're watching Candidate Conversations on DCTV. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with candidate Joyce Chestnut Robinson Paul, running for the office of United States Representative in the general election. Our first question is on the topic of DC statehood. Should the District of Columbia become the 51st state? In your opinion, why or why not? The District of Columbia should become the 51st state. They should become the 51st state because we are American citizens living in the District of Columbia without a vote in Congress and without a voice in Congress. We have uh, a delegate to the House but we do not have senators or house reps. And when you're um, in a government where, uh, when you're in a government where you can uh, vote, then you have a say in what's happening. You pay and you should have a say. So I think that it's very important for we, uh, DC to become the 51st state. I did a rap on it 
and uh, people are hearing that on uh, my Facebook. And it is pertinent that we become the 51st state and there, uh, and we've already gone through the House of Representat Representatives who have, who have voted on that. Now we're trying to get the Senate to vote on statehood for DC. We feel that when you put it on a calendar and you never bring it up, but you can bring up um, a um, US, US Supreme Court nominee, that is not fair. You know, if you can, and, and that goes for voting rights, and that also goes for the stimulus program. They should be voted on. Uh, our our uh, citizens are in trauma because they cannot work and they need to have a, um, all of those things come forth from our government that we pay taxes for. Thank you. Our community and our world are currently fighting a major pandemic. As a community leader, what would you do to address the range of issues caused by COVID-19? Well, the first thing I do is make sure that I cooperate fully with my government and making sure that I wear my mask, making sure that I uh, practice good, good health by uh, washing my hands and doing all of the things that I am required to do to make sure that we do not spread this vicious um, disease throughout our country. Um, it was yesterday that we learned that the president and his wife tested positive for uh, covert virus. It's a sad scenario, but we have to be careful and we have to be responsible in, in this society. As a leader, what steps would you like to take, if any, to achieve a just equitable and inclusive city, and why? I would take a lot more steps that, than is being taken in this city. We have a situation where we pay taxes to HUD and Department of Housing and Community Development, and their, their mission is to provide affordable housing for the district residents. They are not doing that. We are in a situation where so many people are living on the street, veterans are living on the street. It's a sad scenario to have so many people living in tents. If you've ever gone down 8th Street, uh, the unit block of 8th Street, you will see Tent City. I mean, it's a sad scenario. People should not have to live in tents because tents, number one, when the rain comes and the storm comes and everything comes, these people are getting sick and they can infect the whole DC as a result of people not caring about people who, are lim who have limited incomes and who need to be housed. So uh, an equitable city would be a city that makes a larger investment in providing affordable housing in the District of Columbia, providing job training, for our young people when they leave school, you know, everybody's not going to go to college. So um, make, they, they should make sure that the young people that are not in college get some type of training, a, a career training, so that they can move forward with their life in the District of Columbia and have a decent life in the District of Columbia. We appreciate your response. Now, Washington, D.C. has a long history as a leader in providing early childhood education and leads the nation in access to pre-K for both three and four-year-old children. The district is investing over $100 million to expand early childhood education. What do you see as the most important education priorities for serving these young constituents? If, if we're going to take care of that early childhood education, we should have more programs to train our young people coming out of high school in that field. You know, we have a situation where early childhood education, many of our uh, young mothers, older mothers, and everyone has to get 
adequate uh, child care. And child care means uh, good, good child care. You know, you can have child care where um, sometimes people mistreat or treat people like they would um, maybe their children or so forth, but they need to be trained to enhance and develop a child to their best potential. And they can only do that through not just millions in an investment, but investing training and making sure that we're doing the right thing and developing our children at their greatest advantage. So that is my answer to that. Now, candidate Robinson Paul, in the few moments that we have left, tell us what additional information would you like Washington, D.C. residents to know about you? I am a native Washingtonian. I am a mother, a grandmother, and wife. I have four children who have come up out of the uh, D.C. area. They're native Washingtonians also. And one of my daughters was a page on Capitol Hill. She was selected by Congressman Fontroy as the first page for the District of Columbia. And since she was in that position, I've been advocating for statehood for the District of Columbia, mainly because um, when she was there, she was the only, um, the only people that didn't have a vote in Congress. They would have House votes on House committee votes and so forth, and we were not at the table. That should not be. We should, uh, if we pay, we should have a say. And that is the main thing that I'd like to say at the end of this interview. Candidate Robinson Paul, that's all the time we have for now. We thank you for coming on our show and we hope all the best to you in your run for the election. I hope you found candidate conversations both informative and engaging. On behalf of DCTV, we thank you for watching.